you know, let me turn to Jeremy to complement you know, your view from Bamako with a view from the north. Um, Jeremy Swift is uh, um, an economist and anthropologist, recently retired from the Institute of Development Studies, but above all is uh, one of the most renowned experts on pastoralism in Mali and Niger, as well as in many other countries, you know, East Africa, the Horn, Iran, Mongolia, China, you name it. Um, Jeremy is an expert on food security, on farming, natural resource management, institutions, and conflict management, particularly in pastoral context. And um, I've always been inspired by Jeremy's analysis of uh, um, many pastoral environments, but Mali above all. Jeremy, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Mali is in a mess, uh, and uh, we have to be clear about how we analyze that mess. I want to make four points in, uh, in, in ten minutes. One is about the complexity of the situation. I think you've already got a, a feel for that. One is about the much under-discussed question of drugs, which I I is extremely important. One is uh, the, the question of the impacts of what's been going on on the, the north of Mali, on the populations in the north. And the final point is about the future, the potential future uh, evolution of this situation. Uh, on the first one, on, on complexity, we, we talk as though Sometimes there's one war, one crisis, but actually there are three wars and multiple crises. Uh, the three wars are, first of all, a war of secession, which uh, was about uh, Tuareg demanding uh, some form of, of independence for what they called Azawad. Uh, it was the original Tuareg dem demand of some Tuareg, not all, uh, and uh, what, what they, d they get now in, that in terms of that will depend on the negotiations that are carried out at the end of this, uh, this conflict. The Tuareg were in a rather good position at a certain moment when they'd taken over the <coughs> northern two-thirds of the country. They're now in a very bad situation, negotiating situation. Uh, and in fact, as Bruce said, I think they've now dropped, uh, most, most Tuareg have now dropped the demand for full, full secession and would settle for some sort of Devo Max solution uh, 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 of extreme uh, decentralization within a, a unitary Malian state. The second war is the fundamentalist war that is the hot war at the moment. That's largely but not entirely a foreign war with foreign fighters. Uh, there, there are Tuareg caught up with that at, at all levels, but it, it is uh, uh, principally seen locally as a, as a, as a foreign war. Uh, the fundamentalists are fighting to not, not for any sort of independence, but to, to, to turn Mali into a, a fundamentalist Islamic country ruled by Sharia. The third war, and in many ways the most important and the most difficult for long term uh, settlement is the drugs war. Uh, th there is a huge drugs uh, trade going on across the area that we're talking about. Cocaine from South America, kif from Morocco, other illegal merchandise, and that gets mixed up with the hostage taking. So there's quite, a, quite an interesting business model that has been developed in Mali of, of hostage taking and, 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 and drug, drug snuggling. Uh, which seems to be bucking the general economic trend in the world. Uh, it, it's on the way up, I'm afraid. Okay, the crises. The, the, these wars have, have precipitated several distinct, distinct crises, al although most of these crises have their origin much further back than the present war. The first crisis is a humanitarian one that, uh, that has been talked about. Um, the li a crisis of, of humanitarian uh, business and, and, and livelihoods. Um, that, that's, I'm not going to talk about that because other people are talking about that. But I want to talk a little bit about the drugs, the, 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 the drugs war and the drugs crisis because the, the, uh, the, the, the links between organized crime and, and ACME uh, and, and other groups are, are very close. ACME, in fact, uh, the Al-Qaeda have, been, uh, have <coughs> been building a presence in northern Mali for a very long time. They, they, they didn't come in last year. They've been there for, some people say, for 10 years, certainly for five years. And they've been building uh, a, a, a careful program of help to schools, help to services, um, building markets and so on. So they, uh, ACME have quite a, a long-standing position in northern Mali. And that position uh, has now, is now very much in, in involved with the drugs trade and the, uh, and the hostage taking, with different groups perhaps specializing in different aspects of it. But, but the, the, the forms are... A, a very coherent economic business, a successful business. Uh, I wanted to tell a couple of stories about the drugs because, uh, just to give you an idea, Bruce has, Bruce has shot my fox on one of them. 
which was about two local grandees who were suspected Mujao members who, I think the day before yesterday, they, they have an international arrest warrant for both of them is out. They came into Gao. They were nearly, the story as I heard it was, they were nearly lynched by the local population. Uh, they were disarmed by the French troops and handed to the, Mongo Mongo to the uh, Malian gendarmerie. And as the plane was arriving from Bamako to take them to down to Bamako, they were released either by the gendarmerie or by il Hajj Gamou and other local grandees. So uh, th this seems to be a sort of fairly uh, representative e event at the moment. And it's, as Bruce said, it's very worrying. The other story, uh, again, um, I, I can't vouch for its authenticity, is that uh, some French hostages were successfully ransomed a year or two ago. Uh, the money, of course, was marked, and it next bits of it turned up in Paris in the expenditure by the uh, Atite, the president's wife and daughter. Um, whether, whether this is true or not, I don't know, but these are stories that go around in, in, in Mali and, and are, I think, representative of the mood. If we look at the impact of these, these wars, there are direct and indirect impacts, obviously. The direct <coughs> impacts are about people being killed, uh, uh, about infrastructure being destroyed, about livelihoods being, being destroyed. There's been a, a, a very unpleasant uh, renewal of a, of a weapon of war that, I don't know who first invented it, but it, it was used a lot in, in northern Mali in the rebellions of the 60s and the 70s of poisoning wells. Uh, so that the, 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 uh, the, the occupation of, a, of an area becomes impossible for people and livestock. And that, that apparently has started again. There are, there are well-documented cases of wells being poisoned. And it drives people away. But I'm more interested in the indirect impacts of this. Uh, the indirect impacts uh, are about an assault on social organization, on social capital, and the social institutions that make it possible for people to live in these extremely difficult desert environments. The... Um, the pastoral economy in northern Mali, as elsewhere, is uh, it's the product of a mass of crisscrossing criss bonds of friendship and economic activity and cooperation. And these links might well, or lots of these links, might well not survive the present war because they're, uh, th they're, they're among the things that are now being targeted. War of a sort that's going on in Mali is targeting these social relationships. Rape is, is a, a, a very good case. Child soldiers, recruiting child soldiers is a, is a good case. Uh, the, the, the danger is that it, th this sort of social destruction, social capital destruction, will make it impossible to, for, for, for livelihoods to be reconstituted after the, the conflict is over. The, um, the, the consequence would be that the Saharan zone of Mali, and because this would certainly spread quickly into neighboring countries, would be emptied of legitimate activities and sustainable <coughs> communities, and it would become a sort of, a sort of uh, free-fire zone. Now, the activities of the fundamentalist group so far suggest they understand this perfectly, and, uh, and, and, and that part of their strategy is to destroy the existing social fabric of Malian society. And a lot of what they've done reflects this, the, the, destru the, the, the destructions of, of cultural thi uh, things, manuscripts and, and, and memorials <coughs> in Timbuktu is an example. <coughs> Um, the recruitment of child soldiers, I think, is an example, and as I said, rape is definitely an example. Uh, the, 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 the right at the beginning of when the French troops arrived, there was an as astonishingly awful uh, <coughs> event in, in Sevare, near Mopti, where uh, people, people were murdered and, and, and their bodies were thrown into wells. You do two or, th you do two or three things at once when you do that, uh, very unpleasant things. Uh, so so, so we, we must understand that's what's going on. The, how do we see this situation evolving? I, I put together two scenarios which are very similar but actually have a crucial difference. Uh, and, and there are many scenarios we, we could put together, but the, these two seem to me to, sum, to summarize the, 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 the good and the less good way that the things might happen. The first scenario is just that the, the goal of the <coughs> first scenario is that the French troops or others drive the fundamentalists out of northern Mali. And under, under that scenario, the French, uh, uh, with Chadian help perhaps, uh, successfully drive the, 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 the fundamentalists out of the cities, the three cities, and out of the, the areas that they go through. The Malian army moves in, uh, uh, perhaps with the regional forces moving in as well. Uh, th there seems to be likely that if they do that, 
that there will be a, a certain amount, perhaps a great deal of, of, uh, of brutality. That, that's already started in many places. Uh, most of the people who have not fled will do so. Uh, the fundamentalists will, I think, in this scenario, retreat in very good order across a, an international boundary or into the Tanis Roof or up into towards Taudeni or wherever, uh, and, and probably return regularly uh, w whenever they feel like it. Uh, under this scenario, it's the, 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 the Malian army, completely dysfunctional, as, as, as has been said, an, an army which is not even a single unit, it's, it's broken up into two units, uh, that has not been allowed by the, the French to have any real military role in, 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 in the reconquest. Uh, the Malian army will, will take its, is likely to take its revenge on Tuareg civilians. Um, as, a, as a payback for previous humiliations. The Malian army was humiliated a year ago, and, and no army likes that. Uh, if that happens, and I'm afraid it's the most likely outcome in my view, then uh, the social fabric will be destroyed, life will become even more difficult, and eventually most people will move out of the area. Now that's the that's gloomy scenario. The, there's a second scenario, which is that the goal, the goal of which should be to drive the fundamentalists out of Mali and to keep them out to create and maintain peace. My view is that, if, uh, that, that the only way uh, that if Mali is to be secured in the longer term, the north of Mali is to be secured in the longer term against fundamentalist threats, it can't have an empty two-thirds. If you have an empty two-thirds of a country, uh, uh, such an empty space is enormously attractive to, to, to people, to, 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 to guerrillas, to, to the sort of warfare that the fundamentalists are obviously very, very good at. Uh, such an empty space would attract fundamentalists because it would be easy to penetrate, to move around, and such an empty space would, would, would effectively mean that this uh, guerrilla warfare would go on indefinitely. To keep the fundamentalists out of that area requires, in my, to my mind, that, this, that the land is widely or but thinly occupied, that there are no empty spaces. It needs, empty, uh, it needs daily life to be going on, uh, people visiting every corner of the land, people moving around, people, people who can see and report on strangers, who can, people who can provide a first line of defense against a return of, of, of fundamentalist forces. And what the only way this can possibly work at all is, is an extensive, successful, mobile pastoral economy of the sort that the Tuareg are the only people who can, can, can provide. Uh, the Tuareg and the Moors where, in, in the areas where there are Moorish populations. To, to build such an economy needs a rebuilding of social capital uh, at exactly the same way that it needs a rebuilding of physical capital. Uh, preparations for such an outcome would obviously ought to start among the refugees, but in the end it's only a return, a, a protection of the, of the populations that are already there and a return of large numbers of, of Tuareg that will create the sort of s circumstance in which the, the northern two-thirds of Mali can b become or, 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 or remain a, a, a proper part of the Malian Republic. The, the, we've heard that the uh, humanitarian consequences of the present situation are, are, are pretty gloomy. Uh, I think we should be realistic about this, but we should, we, we should recognize, in my view, that, that there is, a, there is a, a good outcome and that we have to be identifying it and working towards it. Uh, otherwise, the, 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 the terrible things that we can imagine are going to happen in, the, in this area. Thank you. Thank you.